everyone. Welcome to this presentation. Uh, we are going to talk about how decentralized identity and verifiable claims uh, disrupt identity and access management. So uh, we believe that uh, decentralized identity uh, will disrupt relationship architecture. Uh, so relationship in this context means how different entities connect to each other. So we are going to move from an organization-centric uh, model that uh, organizations solely uh, register different users and issue a digital identity for them to a model that users have the options to create their own identity and register organizations that they want to have relationship with. So this has a far reaching impact, which may not be um, obvious uh, when we talk about it. So uh, we are going to go into some details and see how uh, this um, uh, change, this technology will uh, impact the business model and also digital identity infrastructure. So let's begin by uh, talking about how decentralized identity disrupt uh, business models. And it really comes down to uh, the digital identity acceptance model that uh, will be broadened in, in our opinion. So if you look at um, digital identity, it's inseparable from um, digital ownership and accountability. So the question is that how we can establish a model that's scalable and hopefully um, universal that guarantee uh, to users uh, when um, they own something, they own it anywhere. And same thing with accountability to make sure uh, what happens and what people do with their uh, digital activities, they can um, be accountable for that. So uh, <clears throat> uh, in web two, uh, unfortunately, the digital identity is built on the back of a model which is uh, quite fragmented and organization centric because uh, different organizations can only trust their own issued digital identity. And there are platforms that uh, play as identity providers that uh, uh, create a lot of challenges from security perspective, from privacy perspective, uh, from interoperability perspective, and more and more we see from regulatory issues. I mean, there are many uh, super platforms that, um, as you may have heard, you know, uh, they um, try to own the digital identity space and offer different business services around it, which um, has created some concern. So all in all, uh, this model um, has been proven uh, that is not as scalable as it should be. And it creates you know, a lot of challenges in terms of integration um, um, and, and helping you know, users to have a smooth uh, experience in digital ecosystems. So this whole idea that uh, the web to digital identity model can be carried over to Web3 um, is not quite accurate. And with Web3, put it simply, we mean uh, an environment that business services are offered in form of a business utility that uh, they are dataless and they are more neutral in terms of digital identity. So we are currently in a period that uh, we see a lot of effort to make uh, digital identities uh, in both uh, Web2 and Web3 coexist. But once uh, we can remove some of the current constraints and uh, deal with some technological issues that uh, digital identity for Web3 goes mainstream, uh, then uh, there will be a big pivot from uh, Web2 digital identity model. So the question is that uh, what the Web3 digital identity model will look like. And I hinted already that 
the model needs to be more neutral, uh, something that we call digital identity neutrality. So digital identity neutrality enables a more inclusive, fair, and secure uh, issuance of digital identity, custody, and use of digital identity and uh, its relevant uh, data. So, and this is uh, very uh, important uh, because we are at a point in time that organizations uh, uh, require or need to rethink how they envision digital identity in their business. Um, if you notice, uh, over the last couple of years, a lot of uh, Web3 um, associated uh, businesses, startups, blockchain platforms are paying more attention to digital identity because uh, now there is a more common understanding that uh, for Web3 to succeed, uh, we need to have a good understanding how digital identity works in that uh, type of environment. So the idea is that uh, organizations need to uh, think uh, thoroughly about uh, their vision and make sure their model enables the use of uh, any proven and verifiable digital identity uh, without any uh, bias toward identities that are issued by themselves. So, and that, can be just opening a channel to accept decentralized identity to begin with in parallel with uh, anything they already have. And this uh, digital identity should enable uh, and support a programmable economy uh, that uh, allow eventually a more universal uh, digital ownership and accountability either in physical world and virtual world um, as we see more with metaverse and what's happening there. So the benefit of uh, digital identity neutrality uh, is, uh, can, can be uh, quite comprehensive. And this may not be clear to some organizations uh, that may feel threatened by losing the control over digital identity. Uh, they had that model for many years. Uh, but in fact, uh, once uh, organizations have these uh, neutral channels, they can uh, open channels to any uh, digital ecosystems that are complied with Web3 uh, architecture uh, much easier. So, so that means uh, more opportunities and uh, faster time to market to respond to market opportunities. Uh, the other uh, factor uh, or benefit is increase in uh, uh, economic activities uh, because uh, we will see uh, that digital identity scope uh, can be broadened, you know, from simple authentication and authorization and more into areas like ownership, data management, data marketplaces uh, that can offer a lot more than it used to be. And the third one is enhanced security and privacy by putting uh, users uh, in control of uh, their data, uh, or at least give them this option that um, if they want to control their data themselves or uh, select agents uh, that custody their data for them. So uh, I think the key, uh, a key takeaway is that digital identity neutrality will pave the way for uh, decentralized identity adoption, uh, which plays a key role in growth in uh, Web3 adoption and uh, going mainstream. So <clears throat> having said that, um, now let's focus more on digital identity infrastructure uh, and how that's being uh, disrupted. And this is really comes down to uh, pushing a complexity that is associated with digital identity and access control more into uh, lower level protocols. So uh, with decentralized identity, we know that uh, we can enable a Web3 type uh, verifiable claims and hopefully eventually uh, self-contained private data pod that can persist 
identity uh, data and isolate that from uh, business services that are offered in Web3 or something that sometimes I refer to it as data-less data -less business services. So with that in mind, uh, we, uh, we actually can enable uh, a more common model for um, digital identity uh, or digital ownership and accountability in, in different ecosystems. Uh, so if we look at what's happening at this point in time, uh, we see that there is a lot of effort to uh, build the foundational uh, infrastructure for um, uh, decentralized identity, which is pretty much focused on uh, doing some basic identity proofing and um, authentication. But once, uh, let's say, give it another uh, two years from now, uh, once that foundational infrastructure is in place and we go mainstream, uh, the functions around uh, this established uh, digital identity can be broadened quickly. So we already see some uh, interest to uh, broaden uh, this uh, functionality to authorization. Uh, so people are talking about or actually experimenting with issuing um, entitlement in form of uh, verifiable claims or even taking that to the next level and issue NFT to uh, establish eligibility and enti entitlement. So, uh, but that can, um, be that can be extended into a more advanced uh, ownership models uh, around uh, the established uh, identity and also more advanced data management functions. For example, uh, right now we have the specification for organizations to issue verifiable claims, but uh, that can be extended to uh, people themselves to uh, issue um, verifiable credential to other entities. You know, for example, when you want to uh, 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 kind of assign power of attorney to another person, you can issue a verifiable credential that's signed by an attorney, attorney or a, a notary, you know, to, um, to give that authority to someone else. So, so there is a lot that can happen uh, in this area. Uh, another um, uh, consequence of this model is that uh, we can establish pluggable digital identities uh, that can be used in different ecosystems. So, and that allows people um, or different entities to attach their digital identities to those uh, uh, business uh, or data-less business services, or let's call them public services, uh, and participate in an interaction or a transaction. And this is all done by uh, some uh, verification protocols to make sure um, all the controls in place. Uh, we uh, prevent, you know, uh, the complexity of configuring different systems, you know, that can be bothersome. And uh, I'm sure, you know, you all have seen examples of it over the years. So, so that, that having that portable, attachable digital identity is a big step forward. And uh, the, we see the uh, evidence that these uh, verification protocols can implement uh, zero knowledge uh, technologies, you know, that even prevent, you know, the data to proliferate as much as it does today. Uh, so <clears throat> a good example um, is, uh, uh, for example, uh, the verifiable cr credential exchange protocol uh, that's being uh, used now. And also we see the uh, signs for some emerging technologies like uh, chain link deco uh, that can uh, play a role in this type of you know, transactions. I think the third uh, area that I, uh, it, it's interesting to observe, the ability to open context independent channel. So you, you, you uh, not only uh, use, uh, for example, that digital identity, uh, for authentication, but you can participate in different type of business processes, you know, whether it's related to education, financial services, interaction with government services, uh, or, or different type of uh, transactions that happens through the life. So uh, all can be built around the same digital identity. So, and, and I think that's a, 
a big win rather than uh, we um, implement and deploy systems that are uh, more, or I mean, digital identity systems that are more context specific. <clears throat> So um, now let, let's uh, go a little bit into more detail that uh, talk about how these things happen. Um, and uh, so basically, if you look at the different dimensions of uh, disruptions here, it really comes down to uh, three key areas. You know, one is trust model uh, that we are pushing it to having um, a more shared um, trust uh, infrastructure. Or in fact, uh, we can envision to establish a public trust infrastructure uh, that can be used by a lot of different ecosystems. Uh, the second area of um, uh, infrastructure disruption is around access control, which as I said, we are trying to push some of these controls into the protocol layer. And the third one is around data ownership, uh, which uh, basically we want to enable decentralized data and decentralized data exchange capabilities and put the user in control of their data. So let's unpack each of this a little bit. Um, I think in terms of public trust infrastructure, you can imagine how much um, added efficiency we can have with that. So the idea is that we build um, or uh, we build this identity trust fabrics, which are uh, really implemented through some kind of a decentralized public key infrastructure. And that allows users to register themselves uh, once and prove themselves once and uh, use that in many different contexts uh, by all participants in an ecosystem uh, to verify uh, uh, their identity or data associated with their identity. So, so that identity trust fabric will be a medium to share metadata or any uh, type of uh, um, documents that can make their public key, uh, the user's public key discoverable. So <clears throat> where we are in that process, uh, we have the ability to establish closed uh, identity trust fabrics uh, at this point in time. Uh, there are examples of public identity trust fabrics, like, like sovereign network there. Uh, the challenge is to make these models work in uh, real life uh, with all different type of practicalities, you know, different legal and financial requirements. So, uh, so our hope is that over the next few years, uh, we see a more uh, interoperable um, identity trust fabrics um, that can be deployed in different domains and they can coexist or even having the options of uh, a true uh, public uh, trust infrastructure that um, everyone can use. So the other area we talk about uh, was uh, protocol layer controls. Um, so, and that's an area that we see potential for enhancing the privacy. So the idea is that a lot of access controls and policies that are enforced at the platform uh, level um, at this point in time, we want to uh, push those controls and policy enforcements into identity protocols. Um, so, uh, and uh, again, as I said, verifiable claim exchange could be a good example. Uh, and we also are monitoring emerging uh, uh, protocols in this uh, space. There are some of them that's coming. One, one more area that uh, I'm looking at as well is chain link deco to see you now how that can support some of different use cases moving forward. So uh, the, in terms of, uh, where we are in the industry, there is a lot of work that uh, that's being done to integrate more uh, native Web3 approaches to what already exists in Web2. Uh, there, there, there is a, a lot of there is a lot of work that's happening in terms of um, uh, implementing interoperability between all different models. There, uh, and that's an area of, that requires more work. Uh, uh, we have uh, too many of everything at this point in time. So we hope that there will be more standardization. And uh, eventually um, 
pivoting to uh, a Web3 model with uh, privacy-enhanced technologies um, and the type of protocols uh, that, uh, in a way, we don't even uh, feel they exist. So they are so low level and they're um, exposed um, to uh, developers in a way that they write applications and protocol take care of many of the uh, issues that uh, we had to implement at the application uh, level. So uh, <clears throat> the next area is the decentralized uh, data. Um, so uh, obviously that's an area that can uh, uh, help with reducing security risk uh, by uh, preventing data proliferation. The idea is that um, issuers um, uh, issue data for um, uh, different entities once they sign it, they pass it to them and they can hold it uh, that data themselves or, or through their agents. And whenever uh, a, verifier, a verifier wants to actually um, uh, use that data as part of a transaction, uh, they can provide that data with their own consent. Um, and uh, that can uh, help with the verifier to complete the transaction or any interaction that that's intended. So this is uh, uh, quite an important uh, step forward. Um, so, and um, it basically streamline a lot of processes rather than uh, we keep proliferating data by sending the data to all different entities and uh, uh, not knowing what will happen with that data, uh, whether it's used for other purposes, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, news the stories about uh, some horror stories over the years, so we don't need to go through that again. So <clears throat> one key component that's instrumental in making this happen uh, is uh, identity wallets and hopefully uh, data pods. Um, so we are at the point in time that we'll see multi-purpose but proprietary identity wallets that can facilitate you know, some of these activities. Uh, we hope uh, to see more interoperability between identity wallets that we don't make the user install multiple wallets to participate in different ecosystems. And in fact, this identity wallet become uh, extremely important for Web3 because uh, it, it, it can play the same role that browser uh, did for Web2 for Web3 because um, uh, as you remember, uh, it's the identity wallet that allows the user to attach their digital identity to different uh, uh, Web3 business services and participate in, in different transactions. So, so I think our hope is to uh, eventually with better standardization and better interoperability, we can enable that universal uh, identity uh, wallet model uh, that um, enable that universal <clears throat> digital ownership and accountability that we were talking about earlier. So now with all the benefits I mentioned, uh, it doesn't mean that these things come easily. There are lots of challenges associated with decentralized identity and verifiable claims. Um, so I listed some of them in this slide, you know, starting with uh, establishing viable ecosystems, you know, all different type of governance issues, uh, commercializations, and, and making sure uh, these environments and these models can sustain th themselves over time, uh, ensuring reliability, recoverability, uh, performance, scalability, and uh, many others, you know, one particular one around user experience, you know, that uh, we actually make the user's life easier, not to make them a system administrator that they need to sit there and manage their own data. So that's the last thing we want to happen. Uh, so, so in a way we want to make digital identity and data associated with that invisible for the user and uh, make it a second nature for them to use it as part of uh, transactions. So, so we still have uh, some time to get there, but uh, one good news is that uh, none of these challenges are showstoppers. Uh, we have seen a steady progress to make improvement in these areas and, and um, 
this is a major uh, <clears throat> technology invention. So uh, we, we can expect it takes a while that we deal with all the uh, issues and, and uh, uh, streamline the process and make it work smoothly. So, but to give you a sense of future, once uh, decentralized identities goes mainstream, it really magnify the relationship experience that uh, users can have in participating in uh, digital ecosystems, in, either in the physical world or the virtual world. Uh, so uh, I think um, that that's very important and that all happens by pushing complexity down into protocol layers more and more. So I have uh, one recommendation uh, and that is to uh, prepare for these disruptions. I think, um, this is not a kind of simple product installation that can happen you know, quickly as, as a simple project. It requires a preparation, both from a business and technology perspective. And uh, all the uh, organizations need to do at this point to see, uh, understand you know, what ecosystems are relevant to them, you know, what, uh, how decentralized identity can play a role, you know, what are the uh, potential verifiable credentials to begin with, you know, what use cases make sense uh, for experimentations, and uh, look at you know, different issues around uh, uh, opening uh, a digital uh, uh, a neutral, um, digital identity channel, uh, looking at uh, issues, uh, legal issue, issues, and that, that uh, it may impact you know, this type of project. So, uh, and from a technical perspective, look at you know, what tools and specifications are available um, and um, try in, their, uh, in, in your labs you know, to implement some of these things you know, and try to, uh, make your developers familiar uh, with these capabilities and eventually uh, test some of them or even uh, deploy uh, uh, this technology in some of uh, production setups. We have actually examples uh, of organizations that now they're deploying this in a limited way in some of their actual production environment uh, and they are um, providing some positive feedback. Uh, so, so in any case, uh, just get ready, be prepared to prevent any shock uh, to your system. So with that, I want to thank you all for listening to this presentation. I hope you found it useful. Thank you. Bye.